Yeah? You're okay? Yes. Everybody happy? Yes. Oh, yeah. Not happy? You don't have to be happy, you know. You know, we can, you know, go through different things sometimes, you know. I'm happy, but I'm, I'm not overly happy. I've got achy knees at the moment, so, you know, but I'm still thanking God that he has brought me here, because we could not be here, yeah? You agree? You don't agree with me? I agree. You agree? Okay, thank you, Sister Amy, you agree with me. Yes, Brother Jacob. Okay. Sorry, my bad. I, I missed uh, two key announcements. So one, Sister Talent, the women's ministries uh, team, will have a, a proposal that they want to, to bring to the church. So um, I'll ask her to come now in a few moments. Sorry, I praise you. She will uh, get you going again shortly. Happy Sabbath, Church. Okay. So um, as part of the women's ministry, um, we have thought of a program where each and every church member is going to get a name of a person whom they are going to pray for. So this was suggested by one of our sisters, and uh, we felt that this is really important, that as members we pray for each other. And um, just like as we have learned today in our lesson study, the importance of prayer for individuals, for us as, as church members, is really important in strengthening us through some difficult times. So we also understand that sometimes people might not be able to walk up to you or to walk up to a person and disclose the sensitive information about the difficulties they are going through. So what we decided is that um, we are going to circulate. So I'm going to circulate this book. If you see this book, um, just put your name down. So I'm going to circulate. This is going to circulate today and possibly um, two or more Sabbaths. And then you put your name down. So when you've put your name down, what we are going to do is that we are going to take that name. You don't have to write your prayer request, just your name. And then what we are going to do is that we are going to um, put those names in sort of a raffle. I don't know if I'm making sense. A raffle where each and every individual is going to pick a name to pray for over a period of time. So you don't have to tell the person whom you are going to be praying for, uh, but you're just going to pick that name and pray for that person silently. And then we are also going to then, after a period of time which shall be announced, we are going to have a time where we are going to um, have testimonies of people talking about their experience of praying for another person. And possibly because we are praying. When we pray, we knock doors. We knock heaven's doors. We unlock um, doors, right? So we, we are trusting that at the end of the period, we are going to be getting people coming up and giving us testimonies uh, and uh, because of the prayers that someone whom they did not know was making for them. So we feel this is a really good opportunity for us as a church also to connect with each other in prayer. So I'm going to circulate this book. If you see it, please just put your name down on the pages there, and then, um, of course, we shall um, give each uh, person a name. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Sister Talent. And so just want to welcome our visitors again. Uh, we have in our midst, I know I met in our Sabbath school this morning, Sister Dahlia from Canada, Toronto. So good to have you today. You said you're coming to an end in the UK, your visit. So pray that God will take you back safely. And thank you for sparing one of those days to be with us at Hanwell. I met Sister Wendy uh, in the corner. You want to give us a wave? Uh, welcome to Hanwell today. Uh, you shared your journey, your traveling journeys to get here. So praise the Lord. You were meant to be here this morning. Anyone else? Any other first-time visitors we've got? That, uh, yes, my brother. I see you. Do you mind sharing your name? James. Welcome, James. Uh, good to have you with us at Hanwell today. Uh, we hope that uh, the neighbors around you will make you feel welcome. Um, yes, anyone else that uh, has been here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other first-time visitors? Well, our regular visitors and those who are planning to be members, we good to see you and good to have you. Of course, our members, without you, we don't have a church. So we pray that you will have a blessed Sabbath. Okay? Praise team, over to you again. Right. Where possible, can we kneel as we sing our intro? Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Father in heaven, as we come to your throne of praise, blessing and worship, your guidance, your goodness, your peace as we worship you as we come to your throne. And may your worship be acceptable to you. Our first hymn of for praise and worship is number 152. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweeter than ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest. Peace and good pleasure. and blessed because he lives. Our next hymn, number 526, Because He Lives. Thank 
everything. Take everything, but give me Jesus. Number 329, take the world, but give me Jesus. Take the world. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold.
So we have Mariah that's going to do a scripture reading. Before she does, I want to say a birthday shout out to Sister Rebecca, who is turning 20 today. So happy birthday, Rebecca. Amen. You want to wave? Don't be shy. Um, it's a big milestone. Amen. That's when you say bye to teenage years. It's gone. Can't get it back. Um, welcome to the welcome to the 20s. Somebody said that's old age. Yeah. So happy birthday. May God. Let's, uh, let's say a word of prayer for uh, Sister Rebecca. Um, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for young lives. I want to thank you, Lord, for the progress of young lives. And as you have blessed Sister Rebecca on this Sabbath to be celebrating her birthday, Father, Lord, I pray that you will continue to bless her. You have blessed her so far in the 20 years of her life. And I know you will bless her in all the years ahead because you are faithful. All of your promises towards her are yes and amen. So keep her in your peace. Help her with her studies. Help her with her future plans. And Lord, help her with her Christian walk. So you know, only a few weeks ago, she made a public declaration to follow Christ all the way. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll continue to hold her up in this journey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from Luke 6, chapter 12. And it came to pass in those days, and that he went out in a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him and his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealots, and Judas the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which was also the traitor. Uh, it's time for our Titan offering, and we'll call on the ashes to bring forth the basket.
tight into the, into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now wherewith here the Lord of hosts. If I will not open, my, will not open you windows of heaven, and pour you out blessings, that there shall be no room enough to receive it. As we pray, use this opportunity to claim every blessing that you've ever wished and hoped for upon your tithe. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for bringing us here safely into thy sanctuary. We have bring unto you what is wholly thine. You've blessed us with the lost, and you ask us to be faithful in these little things. But even in so, you've told us you bless it so much so that the blessing will overflow us, that we would not have room enough to contain it. As we have brought this into your sanctuary, Father, we pray that anyone who is, ble who is pleading with you for a life partner on their tithe, you bless them with it. Anyone who is not well seeking your healing, Father, that you stretch off your hands and touch them. Anyone who is praying for a job opportunity that you'll open many more doors that they would have to decide which way to go. Anyone who is pleading with you for a united family, anybody who is praying with you for a life partner, anybody who is praying to you for any form of help, that you come upon them, dear Lord, and visit them according to your own time and according to your own will. As you have said, dear Lord, that you provide all our needs according to your riches in glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you all we've asked. In Jesus' name we've thanksgiven. Amen. Amen. It's now time for our children's story. And our dear sister Edna will tell the story for today. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, children. Okay, uh, before we begin our children's story, I'd like somebody to pray for us. Who wants to pray? Who wants to pray before we begin our story? Any volunteers? Okay, I will pray. Let us pray. Our gracious and most loving Father, thank you for this opportunity to come to your sanctuary. Even as we want to learn, we pray that you may give us understanding and that you may help us to be better boys and girls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we are in church. Children, where are we today? We are in church and we're in the house of God. And so here we have our deacon, and uh, it's time for us to give offerings. So I just want us to observe, and then we'll get a few lessons from our, le uh, our story. Give and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, run, run it over. Give and it will come back to you. When you give, give to the Lord. Give and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together and run it over, give, and it will come back to you. When ye give, give to the Lord. Give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together and Run it over again, and it will come back to you. When you give, give to the Lord. Give, and it will come back to you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, and run it over again. And it will come back to you when you give, give to the Lord. 
Thank you so much, children. So we have a whole uh, basket full of, of money here. So which money has the greatest value? Is it this one? It is 50, yes, you're right. And so who do you think gave the most? Okay, let's find out. I want us to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 1 and 4. Uh, could you read for us? Uh, and he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw, he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of the abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty paid all in the life livelihood that she had. Amen. You may have your seat. So uh, I'd like us to get a few lessons from uh, the story of uh, the widow who gave only two mites, and in this case only two pens, that Jesus observed how the people in the sanctuary were returning their offering to him. And he wanted to teach them a lesson. He told the disciples that the woman gave so much because uh, he wanted to teach them the lesson of sacrifice. So children, when you bring uh, your tithes, when you bring uh, an offering to the house of God, it should be out of sacrifice. The widow who came last gave sacrificially and not out of abundance. So you should not give out of abundance. You check how much you have, and then you give God uh, the pocket change, but it should be an act of faith and worship. The other thing that uh, we learn from this story is that it is the heart over the amount. Jesus has emphasized that the value of a gift is not measured by the size, but by the heart and the intent behind it. As you give to God, it should be out of your heart. And uh, the God looks at the intention. So we have here uh, God uh, looks at the intention and not how much uh, you have given. And the other last lesson that I want us to learn is that faith in God's provision. The widow only had two pens and she gave all that she had, meaning that uh, she demonstrated her complete reliance on God for her needs and showed profound faith. So I pray that as you come to the sanctuary to give your offering, may you remember that it is the heart over the amount. Okay, children? Yes, yeah, so I'd like us to close with a word of prayer. Who wants to pray for us? Okay. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I pray that we may take this lesson into into our memory and know that when we give things, we don't give so people can see us and that we feel so like that we can like we they think that we're all good and stuff, but we're just really giving it for the attention. We should give with all our heart and with all our soul. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Where possible, can we kneel for pastoral prayer, please?
our Father and our God, we come again before you, humbly kneeling down in satisfaction that you've drawn us here for a good purpose, Lord. We've gone through a lot of different difficulties through the week, but we are here by your grace, and through your love you've drawn us into your presence, that we may acknowledge you as the only permanent solution in our lives, Lord, a common denominator for all the things that we do for you've said in James 1, 17, that all good and perfect gifts come from God, the Father of all lights, who does not leave us in darkness, Lord. And so we've seen your light and we've come today to confess that we are human, we sin every day. I sin, my brothers and sisters sin as well. But we come before you because you promised that when we come humbly and seek your face and turn from our evil ways, and confess our sins, you hear us from heaven and heal our land, Lord. We do look for this healing because we are sick in our souls. We are uh, sick in our pockets. We have bills that we cannot pay. We have joblessness among us. We have discontent in our families. We have people who have turned their back from you, though they are of this you've promised to give us true rest in Jesus Christ. We ask in a special way that this divine hour, Lord, you may come down and take control. We ask that those who have come seeking for assurance of their faith may find it, Lord. Those who have come seeking for healing may find healing. Those who have come, Lord, for companionship, Lord, may find true companionship in you. And we ask in a special way that your man's servant who is going to break the bread of life, may he be hidden under the cross, that you may be lifted up as he speak, that all of us may not hear him, but hear you speak through the influence of the Holy Spirit, that even as we go back to our humble abodes, we may say that indeed we've encountered you and you've changed our lives for better, Lord. We thank you. We ask you that those who are grieving as well, you may take care of them. You may console and comfort them. But above all, Lord, keep us faithful until you come and take us home. For this is a humble prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Hello? <coughs> Testing. Hello? Nice. Ever since I started coming to church, one man in the Bible always intrigued me. Judas. As I studied the life of Judas and the events that surrounded him, it became and began more and more real as I learned about him. I felt I needed to know why he did what he did. And most importantly, what lessons we can learn from the life of Judas. Let's pray. Father in heaven, allow the stuff that I'm going to speak make sense. 
allow us to understand this and let it change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Many of us have been in church for a long time, and we, were, we would know the story and the lessons that Judas tells us and how it relates to us. I've come up with seven lessons that we all know, and I'll go through them really quickly. Lesson one, Judas teaches us that the love of money is the root of all evil. We read in John 12 that Mary sees Jesus, breaks open an expensive bottle of perfume, and she pours over Jesus. Judas gets annoyed and wanted to know why the perfume wasn't sold and the money given to the poor. John 12 verse 6 says this, He said he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, a keeper of the money bag. He used to help himself with what was put in it. Judas loves money so much that he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That's lesson one. We all understand this. Lesson two, Judas was with Jesus. He saw the miracles. He heard Jesus' teachings. What could have caused Judas, who walked, talked, ate with Jesus in the flesh, yet betrayed him and sold him to those that hated him? Is Judas any different from any man and woman here today who once walked with Jesus? Those who have preached, sung, witnessed miracles, and have seen the power of God in our lives, could we go down in spiritual shame just like Judas? That's lesson two. Lesson three, Judas was the treasurer. How did he become the treasurer? Wasn't Matthew the most obvious choice, being one that handled money already as a tax collector? And you could only imagine that he put him there, himself there, just to steal. He must have pushed himself in that position solely based on greed and the potential for money. And this begs the question, are we doing the same today? Are we forcing ourselves into departments for personal benefits? Are we wanting positions in church for the wrong intentions? That's lesson three. Lesson four, Judas's heart. Judas was an example of someone who can be listening to the word of God, but somehow his heart was never transformed. Judas didn't wake up one morning after a night walking with Jesus, witnessing his miracles, and decide to betray him. It was a slow process that fueled and finally triggered by one or more areas of his life that he refused to fully submit to God. You see, when we reject the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's correction, our hearts become hardened and our minds become so damaged to the degree that we can sit through years of service and programs in church and be untouched and unmoved by the Spirit of God. That's lesson four. Lesson five, Judas refers to Jesus as his master. Matthew 26 verse 25 says, Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said to, unto him, Thou hast said. It's interesting that all the other disciples preface the question, Lord, is it I? But Jesus, uh, sorry, but Judas prefaces it with master, meaning teacher. You see, Judas saw Jesus as a teacher, not as his Lord. Judas never accepted Jesus as his personal savior, and that's why his heart was never changed. Who is Jesus in our lives? Lesson six, Judas's reputation. We've got to get to, sorry, we have got to a stage where we listen to messages 
thinking it's not for us. You've probably switched off today when I mentioned that we're speaking about Judas. Thinking, I'm nothing like him. This message isn't for me. But that's the same way Judas thought. John 13, 21 to 22 says, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you, will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. It is never mentioned that the disciples were like, yes, I know it was Judas. I knew it was him. In fact, the text says that none of them knew it was who it was, and all of them was confused. And the reason is because Judas looked exactly like them. Judas blended in very well. It wasn't like when they went out and done miracles, Judas' miracles didn't, didn't work. They wasn't like they were suspicious of him. Judas had the disciples fooled. You see, Judas even thought he had Jesus fooled. Thinking, think about that. When the disciples were walking around and Jesus was actually reading the minds of the the scribes and the Pharisees. Yet Judas had belief and boldness to steal money from the bag. What was he thinking? That he was smarter than Jesus? Is that what our life is like today? Are we fooling everyone? Or maybe we think we can fool Jesus. They were all surprised. They had no idea who Jesus was talking about. These men had lived, traveled, preached, healed, casted out demons together. They had ministered right alongside Jesus. They all, had, they all lived in close proximity for three and a half years. And they had no idea who Jesus was talking about. The thought of it horrified them, and each of them feared that it might be them. All said, Lord, is it I? They did not know who it could be, yet they knew that it could be any of them. The lesson is that you may fool people around you, but you can't fool Jesus. That's lesson six. Lesson seven. Jesus' love for Judas. One thing that I found very interesting is that Jesus never once called out Judas. He had so many opportunities to reveal, to Ju- reveal Judas to the public, to show everyone who he really was, yet he never did. Jesus still loved Judas. Jesus gave Judas time and space to repent and to change his life, to become a different person. Judas didn't take it. He totally refused it. And in the end, that sin ultimately destroyed him. So I've really really quickly gone through seven lessons of the story of Judas. Number one, no one remembered. Judas' love for money. Number two, Judas is so close. <laughs> Judas um, spent time with Jesus. Three, how did Judas become the treasurer? Judas has failed to change his heart. Judas referred to Jesus as his master, not his Lord. Judas cared too much about his reputation. And finally, as I just said, Jesus' love for Judas. Now, all this stuff shouldn't be uncommon to all of us, right? We should kind of know these things. But this week, I learned another side or an angle to this story on why we should love Judas. Okay. Whenever the name Judas 
shows up in the Bible, there's always a comma after his name. It's never just Judas. It's Judas, comma, the one that he betrayed. Now the question is, why does the Bible put the betrayal part after Judas' name and every time it shows up? And the answer is, it's because that is who he is. And at some point, you got to accept that Judas is who Judas is. Our prayers ain't going to change it. Loving them ain't going to change that. Buying them things ain't going to change that. Giving them money ain't going to change that. They are who they are. Stop trying to make Judas something he's not. We need to understand that some people are who they are. And there's nothing we can do to change that. Judas, the betrayer. Imagine your name was in the Bible. What would it say? David, comma. I'm sure some of us have answers for the person they're sitting next to. But think about it. What would it say? David, the late one. Da- <laughs> you guys are dead. David, the angry one. David, the lazy one. David, the complainer. David, the liar. Anytime all 12 of the disciples are listed in the Bible, there are two commonalities. Every list starts with Peter, and every list ends with Judas. And there's never a list where Judas is left out. Wouldn't it be nice if you can make a list of the disciples where Judas isn't there? But whenever you name the disciples, there's a Judas on the list. And here's the tough reality. Judas is inevitable. You can't gather disciples and not have a Judas. Every church has a Judas. Every ministry has a Judas. Every job has a Judas. Every family has a Judas. You can't gather people together without a Judas. Judas is guaranteed. You know who Judas is? Judas is not just the betrayer. Judas is the one that joined and never committed. Judas is the one that gave but didn't want to serve. Judas is the one that got baptized for the wrong reasons. Judas is the one that holds the positions in church so that they can keep control. Judas is the one that wanted to get recognized for the good work the church does, but never had the church in their hearts. There's always a Judas. Judas is inevitable. You can't go through life without a Judas. We need to learn to accept that your life will encounter a Judas. One thing you have to remember is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John writes after the death of Jesus. They knew what Judas done, yet they still put him on the list. Why would he do that? The gospel writers put Judas on the list, not because Judas ain't, but because the other 11 are. What am I trying to say? Don't let Judas make you think that Peter is not a good person. Don't let your encounter with a Judas make you think that everyone else on the list is evil. The lesson is this. Don't let the betrayal of Judas cause you to doubt the love and faithfulness of every other Seventh-day Adventist. 
we've all met someone that said they don't deal with church because they met a Judas. We've all met someone that refuses to enter church because of that one stuck-up person. Someone refuses to give offering because of that one person that they saw steal from the basket. Don't let your encounter with a Judas make you doubt everybody else. Remember, if there's one bad, there's 11 good somewhere. Imagine having a bad experience in a restaurant. What do you do? You don't all of a sudden just stop eating. You either try something else on the menu or go to another restaurant. What am I trying to say? We will all experience a Judas in church. Don't let them stop you from experiencing the love of God. If you've had a bad experience in church, don't leave church. I'll say find another church. But don't leave God. Understand there would always be a Judas in church. Judas is guaranteed. As I studied the story of Judas, it became more and more worrying. <laughs> and you would have to notice that when they record the naming of the disciples, it's not only in Matthew, it's in Mark and it's in Luke. And when you read the different versions and stuff, you would understand that there's, they give you a little bit more insight as you read the gospel. So Luke 6 verse 12 says, Now it came to pass in those days, he, Jesus, went out in the morning, in, he went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. So just before Jesus chooses the 12 disciples, he spent all night in prayer. Jesus spent all night in prayer, and still Judas turned up on the list. You might be thinking, hold on, God. I was praying, and the least you could have done was keep Judas off my agenda. I mean, here I am reading my Bible, praying every day, being nice to people that I don't want to be nice to. I bit my tongue when I could have cussed some people out. I joined the church. I gave my money. God, it seems like the least you could do was make certain I don't have to deal with any more Judas in my life. And yet I prayed, and this is what I got? You see, you can pray about getting a job, and your manager still turns out to be a Judas. You can pray about having a child, and your child still turns out to be a Judas. You can pray about buying a car, and you'll meet a Judas on the road. You can pray about buying a house, but still a Judas is going to break in. Why would Jesus pray all night? He's praying all night because he has a difficult decision to make. Which of the 12 disciples am I going to choose? So the question then becomes, why do we pray before we make a decision? Because you want to make certain that your decision is aligned with God. Follow the sequence. So Jesus prays all night to make certain his decision is aligned with the will of God. So Jesus prays and still chooses Judas. What does that mean? Not only Judas is inevitable, Judas is part of God's will in your life. Judas is not only inevitable, Judas is necessary. 
Notice that Judas is the one that God uses to put Jesus into his purpose. Judas is the one that sets up resurrection. Judas is the one that gives context to God's glory. Judas' assignment is to push you into a place where you surrender to what God is calling you to do. Judas is the one that puts you on your knees and makes you pray for God to give you the strength. Judas is the one that makes you open your Bible and recommit yourself to the word of God. Judas is the one that drove you into the house of God to get your life in order. Judas is the one that showed you that God on my side, I can do everything. Judas is necessary. Judas is what God will use to save you. Thank God for Judas. This is why we should love Judas. You know, as I close, last week was my birthday. And, you know, I went to shower, getting ready for church, and then I came down, and then in the kitchen it started to leak. There was a leak in the house. You know, and on a day I should be celebrating my mind was worried. I was like, oh gosh, I got to deal with insurance. I have to find some people to fix this. But you know, that leak is what caused me to pray. That leak is what got me on my knees. And church, I never knew, Je- I, well, I knew Jesus was a carpenter. But no one told me he was a plumber. Because all week I've been showering and there's no leak. Now I'm not saying that the leak is fixed. I don't know what's happening in my house. But what I'm saying is, our problems in our lives is what causes us to pray. You know, the leak is what caused me to pray. And the closer, the more the leak went, the closer I got to God. You know, it's the leak that helped me prepare this message. It's the leak that got us here today. Thank God for Judas. Let us learn to love Judas is in our lives. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dave, uh, for the sermon. The question I would ask is, are you a Judas? Or have you learned to deal with the Judases in your life? Thank you, Brother David. We're calling the praise team to give us our closing in. Shall we stand together as we sing our closing hymn? Number 184. Thank you.
Father in heaven, allow us to learn to love our Judas' experiences in our life, for it to be drawn closer, for it to be used to be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 There will be music lessons this afternoon for those of us that want to learn the viewers' music, in, music instruments. Uh, is it four, three? Three o'clock today. So uh, come and you want to learn a musical instrument. Thank you. service has officially ended. Um, there's nothing really planned for the afternoon, so please enjoy your, uh, the rest of the day and uh, stay tuned with God as Sabbath is still in tune. Thank you. Oh, yeah. 